Hi folks, this is Jeff de la Beaujardière. Welcome to this month's Sizzle seminar. Our speaker today is gonna to be Charlie Zender. Let me get to his bio here. Dr. Charles Zender is an atmospheric physicist and educator at UC Irvine, where he has been a professor of earth system science since 1999 and of computer science since 2012. His group studies the distribution and fluxes of energy and trace species that interact with Earth's atmosphere on fast timescales. This includes dust storms, biomass burning, snow melt, pollution, wind energy, and data analysis techniques for scientists. Prior to joining UC Irvine in 1999, Dr. Zender earned degrees in physics at Harvard and in atmospheric sciences at the University of Colorado. The Advanced Studies Program at the National Center for Atmospheric Research hosted his postdoctoral research on chemistry and climate. Dr. Zender regularly participates in climate-related activities of the Department of Energy, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. He has also served on the California Climate Change Advisory Committee and testified to Congress on the effects of aerosols on the Arctic climate. Also, this past year, 2021, at the December AGU, uh, Charlie was the recipient of the um, Greg Leptuk named lecture, one of the awards given by AGU and the informatics section. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Charlie to uh, unmute and uh, start his talk. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Jeff, for the introduction and for inviting me back after living through this talk in New Orleans. It was, um, it took a while to produce because it was an important talk for me um, to be the recipient of the SE Leptic uh, name lecture was a big honor. I never got to meet Greg, Le Greg Leptic. Uh, his bio is right here on the title slide. So I will um, though mention a few anecdotes about Greg when we get to about the middle of this talk. I uh, am presenting on two topics that I think Greg Leptic uh, would be interested in. Certainly I'm interested and have been th throughout my career on user-friendly geoscientific information processing. So that's about half the talk. And also, um, and I think we all share this uh, next topic of interest, that is how we can contribute to mitigating greenhouse gases and do so through advancing greener scientific computing techniques. So that's what I mean by eco-friendly data. And um, I'll begin with a little overview, and hopefully there'll be time for questions at the end, uh, where I'll also present my acknowledgements. So this is gonna have three parts to this uh, talk, and the theme across all of them is interoperability, which is, uh, and always has been a very important aspect, I think, of, of advancing uh, geoscience computing. So I'm going to start at the beginning with a brief historical description of the role of self-describing data formats. And then the middle section, the second act, if you will, will be on uh, how domain-specific languages have leveraged these self-describing data formats and brought us to this inflection point that we are at now as geoscientists in the use of our data. And uh, in the third part, which will be about half the talk, I'll talk about the viability of green computing techniques, um, which are now upon us and more urgent than ever. I like to think of the original um, geoscientific computing techniques in the days and decades ago when I um, entered the field as being old school, kind of exemplified by the wizard on the left with a closed book, the closed source recipes for unleashing the power of computers on satellite data, on model data, which was then new at the time. And today's, uh, by contrast, much more open source, open book attitudes where young researchers can within uh, a few months or years of studying uh, data formats and languages actually create and concoct, concoct their own recipes quite easily as exemplified by Hermione Granger here. 
So to take us back uh, to where many of you are right now uh, in Boulder um, and using the, the infamous CCM processor as an example, a lot of climate data and satellite data was stored in idiosyncratic model and data set specific formats. Uh, shown here for the predecessor for the CESM, the Community Climate Model. And kudos to uh, Lawrence Bouja for maintaining this Fortran based code for so long that was so useful to so many. Uh, we should all be so lucky to have codes that are as widely employed as the CCM processor. And one of the interesting things to note is that although this was 40 year, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, the late 80s to the early 90s, this data processing uh, environment was not primitive by today's standards. In fact, it was quite powerful, though it did lack certain features. It had uh, extensible file lists, which you can see uh, here, number of days of history tapes, um, we called them then. It had random access to variables, temperature with a T, but it did suffer from limitations and constraints due to uh, the limitations of the data on disk data format and the lack of an API to access the format. So you can see here, this was data set specific and it was operating spe system specific. This ran on the Cray operating system, Unicos. Well, down the hill, your colleagues and mine uh, in Boulder at the time who are shown here in this artist rendition by Raphael, um, carefully edited by Ed Hartnett, uh, including the Unidata staff who introduced uh, the NetCDF API and backend data storage format to fit um, a new idea, this idea of a common data model. Common data model includes dimensions, variables, and attributes, things that we can't really imagine doing without uh, today, but at the time were novel. And what was most novel, and I'll kind of keep repeating this, um, in my opinion, was that the API allows users to interrogate the data set and obtain um, a sufficiently precise description of the contents of the data set that the user, the client program, can do anything he or she wants. And so here you see uh, actually Ed Hartnett and the creators of NetCDF, Glenn Davis, Russ Rue, and I, Ethan Davis is in this picture too. At the same time, uh, on, the, um, on the other side of the country, more or less, um, in Illinois at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, they developed uh, the hierarchical data format in their spare time when they weren't creating um, browsers and inventing the World Wide Web. So HDF, as it's still known, uh, was both a format and an API. Um, and the HDF developers did something very wise in hindsight. They also created a NetCDF API for the HDF format so that the same API could now access data stored in two backend formats. And HDF was a self-describing format in the manner that I just described. However, uh, in designing the EOS DIS uh, data information system for the EOS constellation of satellites, NASA picked HDF over NetCDF for the original data format, a decision that is still with us today. And so for many years, uh, over a decade, these two formats did not really play well together, but in the background, there were, um, they were kind of the development teams playing footsie with each other under the table until about 10 years later, they, they married the NetCDF API to the HDF5 format, the backend format, and labeled the union NetCDF4. And for the rest of this talk, I'm going to um, use the terms NetCDF and NetCDF4 and HDF5 pretty much interchangeably. So what this uh, partnership, this union of the NetCDF API and the HDF 
five back end made possible is shown here. Um, this is a non-exhaustive list, but some of the most important points are that it's self-describing, as I already mentioned. The data sets are portable, meaning uh, when it was written, we had we had 64-bit single precision floating point numbers in the Cray operating system and 128-bit double precision numbers. So the backend format could change, uh, the length of integer constants could change. All of this was portable now in this format and archivable. We can still read uh, data from way back when. I can still read the data from the CCM2 model on which I based my thesis. Uh, it's scalable because the data sets can grow and grow and grow without increasing the time to access and read the data because it's all randomly accessible and hyperslabs are easily selected so long as they're contiguous. Shareable, so uh, both these formats, uh, this format accepts single write, multiple read. Um, there's also an MPI front end to it, as most of you uh, know. It's appendable, so we, <laughs> So these, this API allows you to add data kind of to the middle or end of a data set now with what we call record variables without having to copy or redefine the entire data set like we used to. And finally, and this is key um, for interoperability, this API, because it supports attributes, metadata attributes, makes metadata a distinct partner of the data so now we can start to label it with instructions. And as a result of all that data set, inner comparison became so much easier that it became um, this format really widely and rapidly adopted by the tools and data producers of the time that included grads and IDL and NCL and NCO, which I'll say more about. The data producers, all the climate models, uh, rapidly wrote back ends. Kudos to, uh, to Brian Eaton for writing the original CCM to NC code um, back in the day. And for, because metadata was now um, widely used, middleware sprang up that leveraged the self-describing characteristics of the NetCDF API, the power of remote clients to access data from a server over the web became used, originally known as DODS, um, now known as OpenDAP or DAP. This uh, middleware took advantage of that, of those characteristics, and finally, metadata standards, uh, whose role can really not be overestimated, especially that of the successor to cohorts, CF, the Climate Forecast Conventions which are really the bedrock on which the uh, WCRP CMIP model intercomparison program has been based. And CF really co-evolved um, with CMIP in the second and third generations of CMIP. And now CF is widely employed uh, by X-Array and other projects like IRAX, IRIS uh, and HIRAX as a, as a DAP server. So I'm gonna use the NetCDF operators um, to exemplify some of the characteristics of domain-specific languages. So they're worth talking about. But first, kind of backing up, what are they? Um, if you haven't seen them, there's about a dozen um, operators. They were written when I, or I wrote them when I was actually working on my own thesis because I needed a way to process data quickly and I was hoping that um, if I did it right, that other people would find these operators useful. And I guess they have, so I'm very pleased with that. They've also been widely used as straw men um, by newer generations of data analysis software to show, well, you know, NCO can do it this fast and uh, ours can do it uh, 10 times faster, 100 times faster. So they've been pretty useful as far as benchmarking um, techniques go. 
And most importantly, in my opinion, and probably the reason I was um, in large part, one of the main reasons I think that um, I've been able to write these operators for so long and stick with them is that they, they were the first set of tools that I'm aware of that treated data sets as if they were atomic data. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, but what that does is it gives you a lot of extra time because you don't have to hand, you don't have to uh, hand craft your analysis for each individual variable. And so that gave us a lot of time over there in the A tower to do things while um, we were supposed to be working. And there's Mark Taylor and I juggling some science. These are the Motley crew of NetCDF operators by name. I'm only going to talk about NCAP2 in this uh, presentation because NCAP2 is by far the most, well, in many ways, the most powerful or the most sophisticated operator. But all of those operators hold in common that, um, and this is the advance that I mentioned before, they can treat data sets as the fundamental unit of data. I don't take any credit for this um, concept. As far as I know, Ru Russ Rue of Unidata originated it when uh, NetCDF was being designed. Uh, but I was in the right place at the right time and was able to implement the set of tools that, as far as I know, was um, one of the first tool sets to embody this power. And what it means is that if you have a data set shown here, a NetCDF data set, data.nc, it's atomic in the, in the sense that we can treat it um, as a fundamental unit of data arithmetically. So if we have two data sets, A and B, and we want to subtract them, we can subtract them with the binary operator and CBO as shown here. And we get the arithmetic difference of all variables in A minus all variables in B stored in data set C, regardless of the dimensionality, dimensionality or type of the variables. Uh, everything's broadcast to the right size and converted to the right type without unit intervention, user intervention. And that brings us to act two. So in drama theory, act two is the confrontation. And um, I'm going to describe how these self-describing data formats allowed us, brought us to the point where now we could take on much bigger challenges um, with what I call domain-specific languages with DSLs. So this um, arithmetic processor is an example of a domain-specific language because it does some things full-fledged languages do. Um, it's a parser lexer based on the uh, antler, another tool for language uh, recognition parser generator. And it uses the NetCDF API for IO. So it's, it's a language. It has loops, it has arrays, it has conditionals, it has print statements, et cetera. And what makes it, in my opinion, a domain specific language is that it does many things geoscientists the domain want to do with data that other people, less, um, uh, less geoscience oriented might not want to do. So while we can broadcast arrays, um, scalars plus 2D arrays plus 3D arrays can equal a 3D array without the user having to run through loops. We can employ statistics, common statistical operations over dimensions of our data set we can use special functions. All of the IO is handled automatically without user intervention. So if you and V are on your are in your file, then you can compute a wind speed in one line. You can avoid the uh, disk access by declaring RAM variables like this loop variable index, and then it won't, won't write to disk. And it will automatically propagate your metadata from one side of an equation to the other side. 
So uh, actually, uh, while I was at NCAR, there were people working on NC NCL was, was developed, um, and now X-Array, a successor um, to NCL, also domain-specific languages, and all are quite capable of doing all of these things. And what these domain-specific languages have allowed us to do brings us back to the title of, of my talk today, which is um, perform rather sophisticated operations and analysis in intuitive ways that are user-friendly. And uh, here I'm gonna demonstrate how that might happen to reconstruct a 3D pressure or a 4D um, pressure field based on the hybrid vertical coordinate system that CESM has used for a long time now. And that um, requires some a scaler, it requires some 1D arrays to set the uh, hybrid sigma coordinate system and a two or three dimensional surface pressure um, from which to build your, inflate your full four dimensional uh, atmospheric pressure from. And then this is what the command might look like in a domain specific language. The user says, hey, I want the pressure and I want it in this order of dimensions and here's how you construct it. So it's short and sweet and I think user-friendly, and it even labels the outputs uh, with the attributes of the first variable on the right-hand side. That's more of a low-level workflow because you're creating one variable. Uh, you can also create higher and higher kind of scaffold with these domain-specific languages, not just um, variable by variable power, create a, a pressure, but data set by data set scaffolding into workflows, entire workflows on large numbers of files. And for example, uh, in NCO, if we were to create a climatology from the output of a climate model sitting there on Glade, we would do something like this and give it the case name and the start and end year, an input directory, an output directory, and if we wanted to regrid it, a uh, file of weights and let her rip. If we wanted to generate CMIP six time series, we would split the data sets, something like this, using standard in, kind of building on the Unix framework of um, pipes and tools and filters. Pipe those into your climatology and say, I want these time series uh, for these years, and I want them regridded. If you were over at NASA, or let me continue with, um, with climate model, if you have a series of outputs and you want to regrid them all at one time and the map doesn't change because they're all generated on the same grid, you might pipe all the files into a regritter. And if you're over at NASA and you're generating level two swath data um, as the satellites orbit in our imaging and the grid changes every time, but you always want the same destination grid, then you would just tell the remapper, here's the destination grid, and it would automatically regrid the curvy linear input grid um, that was annotated with CF conventions to the desired output grid and regrid all of your time varying swath data. So none of this can be done um, by any one person. In NCO, what we, uh, what the NCO contributors have done is about five of these boxes, uh, the C++ library, the C library, the front end executables, which call these two libraries, and some scripts, the remapping and climatology scripts that call the binary executables. So all of this, uh, all of the, the stack of, of domain specific languages, such as uh, X-Array, NCO, 
Julia, Ruby, rely on similar layers of infrastructure, of software and middleware. And we fully take advantage of ESMF and the contributors to ESMF and Tempest and the MPI library for um, node distribution of our workflows. I'm gonna say more about the CCR in the next part of the talk. We leverage OpenMP and we build on the Unidata team's advances in NetCDF and standard Unix libraries and regular expressions and units and the GNU scientific library for statistics and sitting on top of those all sit on top of the lowest level um, scientific infrastructure, the linear algebra subroutines and the basic um, HDF libraries. So it's an ecosystem that plays well together because all of these um, boxes are interoperable. And this is where I'd like to, for those of you who never met Greg, and I'm one of them, one, one of them introduce what I've been told are some of um, Greg Leptik's really um, most professional passions, which were interoperability. And um, although we never met, I'm told by Chris Linnis and Jim Acker of NASA Goddard, um, who worked in the Giovanni group with Greg Leptuk back in the day, that when Greg was um, helping redesign the Giovanni um, workflow analysis package that NASA uses uh, to this day uh, to, to become version four, he was very concerned about not leveraging the existing kind of blooming of analysis toolkits that were out there. They were tied into an older format, you won't say which, um, but he recognized that if we used NetCDF as their internal format, the entire library of NCO would be available to us as well as the usual grads and IDL. And when Giovanni switched to Net, the NetCDF self-describing API and, and workflow, they were able to significantly improve by something like a factor of three, the speed of their accessing the backend satellite data and processing it. And so that's very gratifying. Um, I think this shows how Greg Leptuk was as concerned as anyone about the user friendliness and the interoperability of the data that he was trying to make publicly useful. And I can think of no higher command, to, no higher compliment for a, a software engineer than that. So I, I wanna summarize some of the issues um, that have been solved by the, con by the combination of um, metadata conventions and domain-specific languages. So we've solved the issues of units conversion with UD units, for example. We know how to attach geophysical meaning to variable names uh, using the CF, the Climate Forecast Convention standard name feature. We know how to stitch data sets together now, how to uh, concatenate data sets along a time dimension or along spatial dimensions. And uh, Python does this with MF data set, uh, the web server middleware, middleware DAP and Hyrax uh, do this in assembling and keeping transparent to the users, the complexity of the backend data library store. And something I'll say a bit more about in another slide is the, is the uh, climate um, aggregation, climate forecast aggregation convention. We know how to associate variables with formulae. So very key. So if you wanna solve the ideal gas law, it's easy now for clients to identify the contributors to the ideal gas law formula by looking at um, the formula terms metadata. We also have solved the problem of grids and projections with various conventions ranging from ESMF to UGRID 
to the CF grid mapping and um, well-known text conventions. And so all of the contributors, all of the uh, geoscientists who are, are working on these conventions, especially OGC, ESMF, folks at Unidata, my hat is off to you for all that you've done to advance the, the geoscience data analysis ecosystem. So I mentioned CFA, and this is something that I think is going to become increasingly important. So this is exactly where we are kind of instantaneously as a snapshot. This has not yet been adopted uh, into CF. It's been written and proposed by David Hassel and colleagues um, at the National Center for Atmospheric Science in England and elsewhere. And what, we're, what they're doing is taking um, scaffolding this, this file as an atomic unit of data to the next level, um, which allows us to really represent entire ensembles of data sets as single um, opaque to the user collections of data by having single files, these aggregation files store the coordinates um, and pointers to the coordinates of the aggregated data and what files they are in. So this is gonna be a very powerful way for uh, future model and a comparison projects to simplify uh, the location and reduce the volume of individual files in a user transparent way, as long as clients adhere to these climate and forecast aggregation conventions. So keep your eyes on these, they're in the works. And now I wanted to um, give you an idea of where I think the low hanging fruit uh, for geoscientific data analysis is. And I think that tractable with metadata conventions and domain specific languages and artificial intelligence and natural languages are issues of a sort that I think are really well summarized by an exchange that Paul Ulrich of UC Davis and I had where Paul said, we should be able to treat climate data sets as atomic objects as well as files. So to divorce the climate data with, from the number of time steps per file and which files contain which variables. The CFA is a step in that direction, but what we're talking about here is as geoscientists, it would be great if the domain specific languages understood our intent, the user's intent, and examples of that, many of you can, can read this and know what it means, but the domain specific languages don't support this yet. So we want the 500 millibar geopotential height for summer, June, July, and August. Like we know that, that's a shorthand. We can train domain specific languages with the dictionaries to interpret our shorthand. Oceanographers can do the same with the meridional overturning circulation for a decade in the North Atlantic. Every, uh, in our domain, we have our shorthands. And with natural language processing techniques, I'm looking forward to uh, software engineers and natural language scientists combining the two uh, based in toolkits like Pangeo so that we can finally use natural language to perform our data processing the same way we ask our smart speakers or TV sets um, to play Yellowstone season three, episode four. We're giving increasingly complex commands to these objects and the path forward is, is fairly clear in my opinion that as uh, geoscientists, we could be really saving quite a bit of time by training our domain specific languages with our own language. And I'm gonna switch gears completely. Um, in act three of drama formats, you have the resolution. And I think what I mean by this is that 
we've talked about how we got to how we um, created the possibility of having such powerful domain specific languages. And now that we do, and now that the metadata that's necessary to treat our data sets intelligently and uh, in an optimized format exist, we can really start to use these tools to resolve some of the problems that we've created for ourselves, including the problem of carbon emissions caused by excessive storage of data. So it's been estimated that data centers themselves consume about one to 3% of global electrical power and that that contributes about 1% of global CO2 emissions. Data centers, uh, rough guess, rough um, actually educated estimate uh, account for, or data storage accounts for 40% of the use of large scale data centers. Now, geoscience data is only a small, small fraction of what data centers are storing. But geoscience is an instructive example because compression applies very well for it. And in the future, we can use it more efficiently because we're storing a lot of false precision, a lot of highly entropic, meaningless random bits at the end of our 32-bit and 64-bit numbers. So I'll come back to that in a second. That, that will be a target of lossy compression. Other more um, other ways of conserving and reducing greenhouse gas emissions by reducing electrical demand from running our models are becoming increasingly recognized and used as benchmarks to select next generation high performance computer systems like the Department of Energy with its exascale systems is really benchmarking the uh, re, the remapping operations of its climate model, E3, E3SM, in terms of um, a remap rate per watt. So you can see here um, combinations, or you can see here examples of CPU systems and GPU systems, and the trade-offs of the two, and the DOE is moving more and more towards the GPU systems um, with exascale, but that creates problems for the scientists and the data scientists who are maintaining these codes. And so here we need to rely increasingly on um, hardware agnostic APIs like COCOS uh, for C and C++. So DOE is moving towards has adopted COCOS for its next generation SCREAM model, um, the cloud resolving EAM model. And then in the Python world, we have Numba. And what these frameworks do is they make the back end hardware format, GPU or CPU, transparent to the user and work to optimize the code on whatever platform it's running on. So this is great work that can help us reduce power consumption. It's also true that the choice of language um, strongly affects the energy efficiency of, um, of computing codes. So uh, studies in 2016 and 2021 intercompared really all the languages from compiled language, from compiled languages like C and Fortran down to interpreted languages and ranked them in terms of time and memory, um, optimizing energy and time at the same thing or energy and memory or all three. And if you look at a normalized plot of this where the most efficient language in terms of energy is shown as uh, one and then the, the multiple of that efficiency due to every other language for a suite um, of benchmark uh, scientific computing problems is shown here. You can see where C and Fortran fall very well is where they fall. Um, in terms of execution time, it's highly correlated with energy. 
Uh, some of the variance, about 10%, is due to the memory usage by those languages. And so we need to pay attention to this. And fortunately, there are, uh, geo there are scientific software engineers who are who have taken this on and really made an art of making languages run more efficiently through techniques like basic linear algebra subroutines, through techniques like compiling Python with Cython, and through techniques like Numba. So these are all very important ways. And this is why this chart is not any kind of a dig at um, interpreted languages like Python. These tools bring those languages up uh, into the competitive league with compiled languages. And that's very important work. So to see the impact uh, of our storage on our own carbon emissions, uh, an undergraduate student and I constructed a bottom-up inventory of geoscientific data storage. And this is uh, an incomplete um, survey because we only got responses from a fraction of the institutions that we contacted. We estimated that there's more than 3,700 petabytes of geoscientific software, including, you can see some NCAR labels up here. There's some big heavy hitters, ECMWF, Copernicus, um, NASA, of course, and a lot of these larger stores are using tape. So what does this mean in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Um, well, when you add on the data that we are carrying on our laptops to the data that the data centers are storing this, you get about 3,700 petabytes, and we know that's an underestimate, but it's a useful place to maybe start considering what your carbon budget is because of the data that geoscience stores. So satellite data, CMIP data. And we can estimate that quite readily by using standard conversion factors for the power consumed by data stored on PCs, on hard disks in data centers, in kilowatt hours per terabyte per year, and on tape, which is just much more efficient. If you convert that into uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour, you get about half. And multiplying that by the 3,700 petabytes of data storage, you get about 10,000 tons of CO2 equivalent carbon emissions per year, just due to the storage that you and I and other geoscientists use professionally on these data stores on our laptops. In North America, our, our average per capita carbon budget is about 10 tons per year. So what we're talking about is the possibility of affecting, if we adopt more compressive and conservation-oriented geoscientific computing and storage techniques, we can eliminate, by my estimate, about 1% of our personal carbon budget. So it doesn't sound like a lot, but hey, uh, we need to wedge this thing to death, this uh, carbon accumulation. And a 1% wedge is really just the start. It can be more, I'll show you how. If we really leverage compression, we can do even better than that. But in the historical sense, in the last 20 or 30 years, we have not done a good job of this because um, using compression techniques has been difficult for the users, for the data producers. Access to modern compressors is difficult. Uh, compression re requires extra post-processing steps. It's been too slow both to compress and then to decompress and use the data People have thought that loss of compression might distort the data. Uh, we didn't know how much of the precision of numbers to retain. Uh, the formats were inflexible. All of these reasons 
probably the greatest one is that as scientists, we're loath to throw away any of the um, information that we generate with models. But things have been changing rapidly. Um, Net CDF sits on top of HDF5, which supports filters natively, about five of these filters. Python sits and uses numcode codex, which has its own compressors, including BLOSC, which is a meta compressor, highly optimized for speed. It's great, you should check it out. NetCDF has lagged behind uh, for quite some time in supporting modern codecs. That's changed too. With 4.8.0, NetCDF supports ZAR and NUM codecs. Um, with the current development branch of NetCDF, we, uh, NetCDF supports lossy compression, bit groom, granular bit round, and now a project called the Community Codec Repository is available to all NetCDF users. Uh, Ed Hartnett and I have taken this on for the last two years. It builds the filters for you. Configure, make, make, install. You get your filters, you get the CCR library. With these modern codecs, you get the API so that you can, so that model developers can define their desired compression, their pre-compression filter, their lossless compression from the get-go. So the data never hits the disk until it's compressed. It's no longer done in post-processing. This is kind of a first for, uh, say, climate models, the ability to do this. So we can have efficient compression in the production phase. I don't want to run over time. So <clears throat> let me skip some of these benchmarking techniques where you can see lossy compression reduces file size for climate data, uh, even relative to lossless compression, which is what CMIP6 is based on. So this is what we're advocating for CMIP7. A lot of this is based on quantization, which means trimming, rounding, chopping, the least significant bits of floating point numbers like pi to retain a given number of significant digits, NSD. When we do this with modern compressors like Z standard, we reduce the time to compress data with old um, standard traditional compressors like ZLib. And you can see now uh, that here, this is speed, so higher is better. ZLib is pretty slow. Z standard can be slow depending on the data set. But these compressors are really reducing data set size quite nicely. And when we add loss, lossy compression to the lossless compression, we're getting factors of two to five reductions in size relative to losslessly compressed data. And we're coming within factors of two of the right rate of uncompressed data. So we're in an era where modern codecs are very becoming very competitive. Not only that, we can swap out the old codecs like ZLib with ZLib Next Generation. Plugin compatibility works well with NetCDF. We can use loss, lossy compression in combination with lossless compression to get compression ratios on the order of three to four while retaining all the scientifically important information. So I think we're at an inflection point. We can also choose new methods. Uh, a new paper by Milan Kloer in Nature Computational Science shows how to apply information theory techniques as used in JPEG and MPEG compressors to preserve information content, um, I see information content by uh, identifying the information content using information theory. And you can specify a threshold for how much of the information content you wanna retain. We can do nifty manipulation of not storing as much data as we previously stored. This is very important for satellite data. 
for curvy linear swath data that never repeats its grid. This is nearly half of the CF conventions now are a new chapter on coordinate subsampling, where now satellite data especially, which currently uses more data to store the grid than to store the observable data, um, because you need to store the grid center point and the vertices to be CF compliant, and that's a lot of double precision numbers per observable. Well, now we're getting uh, compression like 40 times with real data sets like VIRS. So we've solved a lot of these problems. Um, we can pick the number of significant digits or bits or the information content or Allison Baker's um, structural similarity uh, metric to identify what data to store. We're on the edge of using new data storage formats, posits that might be 16 bits will conserve energy. We can use ZFP as a data storage format. We're still struggling with the culture of keeping false precision and we need to do better there. We need to allow the work of people like Allison Baker and Dort Hammerling and Sizzle and John Klein to instruct us when we have enough of the scientifically meaningful data, we don't need to store the false precision. We'll be discussing a lot of this at our SE session at EGU 22. Thank you, Allison and John and others who have contributed your abstracts. My last slide, I think we're at a data inflection point. How we got here is using self-describing formats to enable tools and DSLs to treat complex data sets as atomic data. There's a lot of untapped potential there, including identified natural languages. So Python fans, Pangeo fans, let's get on that. We can do end-to-end -end modeled archive compression. Couldn't do that before. So no more post-processing. It's transparent to the user to use these data. So it's user-friendly and interoperable. We can store much less data while retaining all the scientifically significant content. And I think that we in our field who tell policymakers what the, um, best strategies are to reduce, what the options are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, need to do that ourselves where we can and eat our own dog food. And lossy compression is a great way to do that and has few regrets. So I'll leave up my acknowledgements while I, um, I take any questions that you virtual attendees have that I can answer. Thanks for your attention. Great, uh, Charlie, thank you very much for your talk. Good to, uh, good to hear it uh, again on some level since I was at the AGU when you gave it, although I'm more comfortably seated here and able to see it better, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think, by the way, this is just a comment. It might be interesting for you to give an expanded version of the lossy compression part to the NCAR Climate and Global Dynamics Lab here at NCAR because obviously they generate a lot of model outputs and um, you know, it would be good to, to really address this lossy compression business. Happy um, to do so. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, I'll take the first one. Let me kind of zoom in to see. Um, uh, by Ufuk Turumkolu, is it possible to use RDF slash OWL language and query language like Spark Sparkle to achieve natural language processing and auto generation of the processing workflow slash algorithm? Could it be used to support AIML? I think this is ex kind of exactly what I was talking about. I'm not familiar, Ufuk, with the acronyms RDF and OWL, but the context of uh, the question allows me to interpret that um, to suggest that these are existing frameworks for natural language processing. 
And that is exactly where I'm advocating we geoscientists adapt and train these frameworks to understand our natural, to understand our dictionaries. We need to build the dictionaries. OGC has great standards for, for assembling these dictionaries and we need to splice them into uh, similar technologies that we're already using at home uh, to control our environment and to ask for help for automated, from automated algorithms. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, next question was from, oh, I was gonna say it's from me. Nope, next one will be from Riley Conroy. How do you think data producers should handle data provenance? Would this be a place for additional conventions? Yeah, I think um, data producers should handle data provenance since they're producing the data. That's their responsibility. And there are methods for doing this. And I don't know that they can be done without conventions. I don't know that there are additional conventions. And those of you who have looked into ISO 90115 and metadata conventions from ISO will know that there's a bewildering and perhaps um, daunting array of conventions for metadata. NASA has a working group on it that I used to be involved with in the Earth Science, um, the Earth Science Data Set Working Group on um, Provenance. So I think uh, if the question is, what can we do? Um, better, well, recognize what we're already doing. The original version of NetCDF has a history attribute. That's your basic place to start. And then um, there are engines like proven providence, um, provenance uh, engine that actually allow chaining and scaffolding of provenance through the workflow. And that's very important because I know that um, in the CF conventions, provenance is taken very seriously. And especially with you know, tying into this talk, people who receive lossily compressed data wouldn't know that they were lossily compressed if we're doing our jobs right without the addition of metadata to tell them that it's been lossily compressed. So these are current issues. And if you're interested in this, Riley, the CF conventions, David Hassel uh, and I are leading an effort to kind of write down what these um, metadata conventions should be for provenance on things like lossy compression. Okay, Jeff, the next question from you. Yes, um, and uh, thank you for me mentioning the, the lossy compressed data in provenance, I was gonna comment, that would be very important. Um, have you done any testing, maybe it's kind of subjective, of um, lossy compressed data versus the original in terms of the ability of users to tell the difference. I know we could numerically compute some statistics and you'd like to not skew the statistics. I think Dort Hammerling had done some work on kind of visual comparison and when can people tell yeah. the difference, but I, I don't know how much of that has gone on and you know how you, how you, how you feel about that. Yeah, I think this is work that um, I think some of the best work on this is being done in your backyard there at um, by Allison and Dorrit at School of Mines. And they have told us uh, in the community about a library, sort of a testing harness that they have created that performs all sorts of tests, structural similarity tests, gradient tests, so whether a machine can tell the difference is one thing, and they have very sophisticated ways of assessing that. Um, but my impression, I'm just gonna off the cuff, is that we know that models can produce cloud fields, for example, at global three kilometer resolution, in the Diamond Project, that no one can tell which one was the model and which one was the uh, satellite observation. And to the level that most geoscientists have confidence in models, to the level that the model developers have confidence in the precision of their models, there's absolutely zero reason 
to keep seven significant digits, much less six, much less five significant digits um, in our data because the uncertainty in the initial conditions and in the parameterizations themselves are much greater than that. And so we're not really losing anything. So for lossy data, as long as you don't use it in your restart files, um, which would not be healthy for bit for bit reproducibility, um, as long as you don't use it in cases where you need bit for bit reproducibility, there's really very little reason to retain all that data and users to the two or even three significant digits that are reported in most journal articles would never be able to tell the difference. Superstition. Okay. We're technically at the end of time. I'm hoping we can keep going for a couple more minutes. Uh, Davide says, nice talk and nice meeting you. I joined NCAR after you had already left. NLP is quite energy storage and CPU intensive. Can you elaborate on how to reconcile that with eco-friendly? I don't see such a big time saving, but perhaps I'm too much of a computer geek who likes to type. Yeah, I like to type too. I'm glad I took a typing course. Um, I'd like to get away from it eventually. <laughs> David, um, nice to meet you too. So it may be um, more, it may be that natural language processing is more energy intensive than I'm aware. However, we have to consider that energy intensity relative to the energy intensity of the workflows that it's going to control. And the energy intensity of a human being is, is quite a bit more than many computer codes. Remember that even though we're generating all this data and storing all this data, humans are still emitting on average 10 tons of carbon a year, okay? And most of our models um, you know, added together are not doing that. So if we can save ourselves time in typing by having the computer interpret our words, I bet you we'd have a significant energy reduction um, through natural language processing, making us more efficient, making our time more efficient, so um, I don't know that it's actually in conflict with eco-friendly because I think the metric here is really, is the, is the natural language engine preventing you from making more mistakes as you type and have to iterate and retype than it's making in interpreting your language. And yes, like with all technologies, there will be a point It'll be a rough road to begin with where it doesn't understand our dictionaries and we haven't taught it enough. But then like your kids, they're going to blow you away with how powerful they become. Great, thank you, Charlie. Uh, next question from Eric Nienhaus. Thank you for the great three act talk and NCO. What would you consider to be the most impactful changes current scientific data repositories could make to enable earth system science and to reduce the time to science? i.e. to enable democratic access, interoperability, reuse, et cetera? Wow. Well, that's a very big question, Eric. Thank you. Um, so yeah, accelerating time to science is something that, um, you know, people um, who's uh, of my, you know, salary grade don't really think about too much because we're too buried in the nuts and bolts. Um, I think that accessibility is so important and I really didn't mention that. And there's great technologies out there that are making the data accessible. For example, these you know, Hyrox servers and um, discoverability engines. Yet I'll tell you, Eric, that in the remote sensing class that I teach, students spend weeks trying to actually access the data whose images they're seeing on the screen and finding your way there as a novice and through the various portals and sign-ons that NASA and USGS and NOAA require to access and download the data, it's very time consuming. And time to science is, is it's really indefensibly long now. Um, we need to do better with those accessibility 
um, engines. For interoperability, I think the CF conventions are nowhere near the limit where um, their power um, to accelerate science workflows um, has been exhausted. I tried to exemplify that. Democratic access, you know, that's really, um, that's almost a, 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 an income disparity issue. I mean, for democratic access, you and I can access these data, but they're not accessible largely um, to people who live with non first world internet connections and without uh, the infrastructure and the schooling and advice in their educational systems to access these data. And if you wanted to look at the CESM large ensemble um, from the point of view of a farmer in the Sahel, you'd be hard pressed to uh, find those resources. And so I think that that's a much bigger problem that we can't even really begin to address within the context of geosciences without tackling the social science issues of, um, of income disparity first. Great, Charlie, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna read out the next two uh, compliments basically, and we'll skip my minor question. Um, Bridget Thrasher says, no, not a question, just a sincere thank you for creating and maintaining NCO. The operators have been integral to my work over the years and saved me many headaches. Um, and Dan Ziskin says, great talk. I was a friend of Greg when I worked at the Goddard Deck. I believe he would have been flattered by your acknowledgement of his foresight. Um, I agree. I saw him about a month before he passed away at ESIP. Yeah. And he would have been flattered as well, too. So, um, Charlie, we are a few minutes past time, so we're going to let you go. But thank you very much for your talk. Um, we will try to post your slides and a video online for people who couldn't attend uh, virtually and live. Um, thanks again. And See you, see you soon, I hope. Thanks for the invitation. Bye, Jeff. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <clears throat>